Violinist Yehudi Menuhin's phenomenal career has spanned eight, count them, eight decades. At the age of seven, he played Mendelssohn's violin concerto before an audience of 9,000 people. Proclaimed a genius, he conquered Paris and New York by the age of 11. He has been described as the colossal talent of his time. Over the years, he has extended his virtuosity beyond performance. In 1962, he founded the Yehudi Menuhin School, which has become a training ground for promising young musicians. I am pleased to have him back at this table. Welcome back, sir. Back to my hometown. I yes, was born indeed. here. And you would recently celebrated your birthday. 82nd, 82 years, yeah. day before yesterday. And I reminded you that you once said that you had lived life in reverse. You were <clears> born <throat> old and you've been even younger ever since. That's true. I was, one of the uh, congratulatory messages I received was indeed that you seem to be getting younger with each year. I'd like to meet you when you're 40. <laughs> <laughs> well, do, how do you feel today? I mean, I you feel... seem young and, and you seem... I do. I'm interested, Vital. I'm interested in, in life. I think there's a growing interest in the future. I, as, if I can generalize from my own experience, I know that when one is young, one does think of one's own immediate future. I began thinking of the world at large and humanity quite early, but I feel that as I'm growing older, my own future counts for less and less, and it's the future of, of, of the others, of the young people I know all over the world, of the musicians I know, of the children, my own children, and uh, of the humanity at large, which is facing now a great period of trial and tribulation. Trial and tribulation? Yes. From what factors, you think? What concerns you when you look at, th at their future? What concerns me is the need to develop, an, <clears throat> how should I say, fulfillment of our, of our capacities, of our, of our inner uh, moral, romantic, creative faculties, which are essential as part of our birthright. Every child is talented. People, I've always hated the appellation prodigy, you know. I felt I was perfectly normal, and I still feel I'm normal, and more so as I've come to know over the years, young children, all of whom are talented, mm -hmm. and talented for one thing or another. And that talent is so often crushed and so often made to serve a particular purpose, advancement, some particular ambition, parents' ambition, is subject to parents' prejudices or society's expectations. And the child in itself is a complete entity. And I find that when its capacity is the senses, first of all, the oral sense, hearing. Mm. A child can hear at the age of 12 weeks in the womb, the ear is perfect. And from then on, it communicates through the ear. And its first response is the primal scream, if you wish. And that's an announcement of already being there and having been there. And uh, in fact, the gypsies have an interesting habit. The father often sings on the stomach of his expectant wife. Yes. And it is, in fact, I read a few days ago that songs that the child hears in the womb are recognized when it is born and more quickly uh, assimilated, apprehended. Someone here not long ago was talking about the, the advocacy of playing quality music, classical music and other good music yes. uh, bef during the pregnancy. Yes. Well, I think that is very important. Uh, there is a reaction. In fact, there is a sequence in the film I made, The Music of Man, some years ago, Canadian uh, mm -hmm. television. Uh, where we show exactly the reaction of the child in the womb to music, yes. in, visually. Do you feel that you, I mean, this idea that, that what we might not do is allow everybody to full utilization of all of their talents. Exactly. Do you look back at your life and say, one blessing for me, one gift for me, was that I found early my talent and I was able to nourish it However yes. large you want to count it, at least it was nourished. It was nourished, and I'm very grateful for parents and teachers who kept alive the ideal, the, the example, and something beyond the music itself, which is the serving of communication of the, between man and his environment, between man and animals and, mu and other people. There is something, there's another dimension beyond just playing the music that's printed. And yeah. that is the communication of something which is 
impalpable, but does make other people laugh or smile or cry or long for or wish to recall or nostalgic or hopeful. These mm. are real sensations. What is it that when they talk about prodigy, when they talk about musical genius, let's say in a violinist, what is it? I think it's a supreme desire to express its own feelings and to be heard and to hear the response. That's, that is what it is. A child is saying, this is what I feel, this is what I hope for. All you need do, as I have some time <clears throat> often at my school, is to hear a Japanese girl playing a Beethoven romance with all her heart and soul, with so much beauty and sensitivity and expression. And you say, what, what is this all about? And I think it's come out of a thousand years of the suppression of the woman in Japan. And for once, she can express herself. It's a release. And in the case of the Jews, in the case of the gypsies, it's very much the same. They have a lot to say. And any child has a lot to say, only we immediately give them the, the, the framework, a rigid framework, and say, say it within this uh, context, in this style, in this way. You're going to do it exactly as the teacher tells you. And often we kill the musical instinct that way. But well, what was it about you? Your teacher, George Inesco. Inesco, witnessing your playing of Bach when you were 11 yes. years old, described the experience as the strangest, most exalted experience of his entire life as a musician. He said that your interpretation of that piece showed him that you had an understanding of the human soul at 11 years yes. old. But the child is born with all the lives of those that preceded it. We wouldn't with the be what? with all the lives of those who preceded. With it's an that. understanding of all the lives. With well, the what? with the with heritage of uh, he oh, wouldn't okay. be here, she wouldn't be so here. So the gene pool and, delivers and yes. that too. And him. then you see, uh -huh. take Bach, take specifically. What is it in his music that is that is so great? It is the element of universality, of reverence, of passion, but not of egocentric passion. It's, a, it's the uh, sufferings of, of the Lord, all right, but they stood for everybody else's sufferings. So that it, music until the Romantic age, as long as it was uh, sacred music, was describing all the suffering and the joys and the satisfactions and meditation, what you will, but through the uh, life of, of Jesus or the, the sacredness of the sensation today that sacredness has disappeared, and you'd find it very difficult to um, instill the basic emotions of reverence and serenity and, and meditation, for instance. But they are basic to the human being and basic to the child. And I was not stranger to those feelings as a child because my father came from a long line of rabbis. All right, he was concerned with the uh, sad state of humanity at the time. He was, uh, he was quite left-wing and um, in, the most, in the purest and most idealistic possible way. So I too was concerned. In fact, my first uh, hope, my greatest wish, was to play the Bach Chacon. Yes. In which the, you played at 11 when he heard 11, you. To play it in the Sistine Chapel. Uh -huh. I imagine the Sistine Chapel must be where the center of religion was. And that if I played it well enough, there would be peace on earth. Of course, it's a child's uh, stupid idea, and yet it had a grain of truth. It, peace depended entirely on how well I played the piece. <laughs> if it were really good, it would happen. You would play the violin in Sistine Chapel? No, never. never. No, I never have. I did meet the Pope and gave a concert for him uh, some years ago, but I never played in the Sistine Chapel. When have a violin's ever been played in the Sistine Chapel? I don't know. I'm sure it could be. I'm sure these days there would be an objection. The, the program I played for the Pope had works of the, um, of the uh, 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 Masonic Mozart, yeah. uh, of uh, Protestant Handel, 
of, um, and it, the Bach was sung by an Israeli singer, and, but the orchestra was composed of Poles, my favorite orchestra, this wonderful Symphony of Varsovia. The Warsaw, yeah. And of course, they were thrilled and to play for the Pope, as you can imagine. Do, is, does your religion, your religious ancestry, uh, is it always present in your music? I think as pure religion up to a point, as service, as, as a sacred uh, work, as uh, the first uh, work that was ever dedicated to me, Bloch, a great composer, and Bloch was living in San Francisco at the time, and I was about seven when he knocked at the door with a manuscript entitled Avoda. Avoda means a form of sacred work. And I've always looked upon whatever I did as having a, uh, a sacred purpose, well, simply meaning that I was serving. I was serving the music, the composer, the communication. And that it has extended itself in a way that uh, music has also become the voices, the voice of the voiceless. The voice of the voiceless. voice of the voiceless. For instance, I'm working, and it's coming along, on an assembly of cultures there are in Europe. There are hundreds of cultures which have no voice at all and are pushed around. They've never had, they've been minorities perhaps, in the monolith state. And in any monolith state, it always tries to speak with one voice and not the voice of the minority. And so that has been an ambition of mine and it's gathering, it's gathering strength. And I think it's quite important. I think it could apply to any uh, composite entity consisting of many many voices. When someone asked you how you thought you'd be remembered in a hundred years, you said, I don't think they'll remember me at all. I have no left, no works, no masterpieces behind. I really do not live for, for posterity. posterity. I hope I've been of some use, that is all. You left yes. nothing of enduring value in music. No, I've never composed. Now there are and recordings. That's how you, is that how you would define enduring value, composition? Well, I think if a great composer does leave something behind, like a great writer or a poet right. uh, or a painter, a sculptor and so on, music is an ephemeral um, substance, if it's a substance at all. It is tangible in the sense that we, we uh, <coughs> resonate to it. It hits our eardrums. But what about great performances that have been recorded? Why isn't that a, a well, legacy? up to a point, up to a point. But uh, after all, even recording can only really serve to inspire others to, to play Live. better or to yeah. communicate. They are not end products, really, as a beautiful tapestry or would Do be. you think, as some have suggested, some, that you peaked <laughs> when you were a very young man, that you you hit your best a long time ago, um, and that you have not I think necessarily, you got so yes, high, so young. Yes. I think there were certainly ups and downs. I wouldn't necessarily say that I peaked and then consistently uh, unpeaked. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think that... There are things might. that you have done since in your teens that you think is every bit as good as you did then. Well, no, I think that's going back too far. That's going back too far. When do you think you were your best? As a violinist? As a violinist. Um, I would say, with some, with some uh, exceptions, up to about 20, 15 years ago. Mm. But of course, there would, the be, there would be exceptions, but there would be also moments. I don't think that this idea of uh, you know, what disturbs me about human thought is they, they always want to render it into geometry and yeah. into categories right. and to facts. Big, at, better, best. At, at, uh, on November the 12th, he reached his best. Do you think you could have been as good as you were on the violin on another instrument? No, I don't. I, knowing children from our school and so on, there are children that want to play the violin and others that want to play the piano, and even such who insist on playing the double bass, even if it's a little double bass. They want to play the double bass. The violin is easy to explain because it's the nearest to the human voice. 
and you hold it against your neck, <laughs> the vocal cords themselves, mm -hmm. and uh, your body should vibrate to the violin. Too many violinists hold the violin too tightly between their shoulder and the neck, not allowing it to, to vibrate. And um, the bow also should feel as if uh, like a living uh, bird in one's hands, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, that is easy to explain. Uh, nomadic people traveled the violin, it was easy. The gypsies played the violin. The Jews played the violin because, again, it was something close to the heart and something with which they could express themselves. There was such a richness of folk music in that part of, of Europe that binds East and West, the part that binds, well, India to Afghanistan and mm. those the countries of the Black Sea, on to Romania and Hungary. That really was where East mess met West and where the intensity of folk music is at its greatest. Let me close with this question, simple, and the, what are you most proud of? I don't know that I'm proud of anything. What do you, what is it I'm, that... At, at most I can speak of satisfaction. Satisfaction. Yes, if I see a good result to my efforts, if I enjoy playing, if I see children who are filled with uh, with the desire to play beautifully and are balanced and are... And what do you regret the most? Ah, uh, what I regret the most is when I haven't lived up to my, what I should have uh, done vis-a-vis -vis perhaps friends or parents or wife or colleagues or... Uh, there are certain things that, that I could have done better. But um, as long as one can still correct and improve, yeah. I think that's... And, and make a great effort. Thank you. Thank you so much. Pleasure to have you. Well, I enjoyed it. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.